All right, BMAC. What's going on, Mark? BMAC, uh, where are you from originally? Where'd you grow up? Um, so I was born, I was born on the East Coast in Maryland. Um, you know, my mom was going to Howard University, so she had us out there in D.C. Um, but I came up in the West, San Francisco, Mission District, mm. 16th of Mission to be exact, you know. So if you know about San Francisco and the Mission District, you know, 16th of the Mission is probably one of the places where you don't want to go if you don't, <laughs> not supposed to be there, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, that's where made my made my name, you know, and that's where a lot of people know me from. Um, but being from the East and the West, you know, it just helped me be who I am from a real dot connector. You your know, mom, so your mom was me. good? Yeah, my mom's good, yeah. What was your dad? Honestly, you know what's crazy? My dad, I never ever met him. I've only seen him one time and that's in a picture. And yeah. that's with my older sister. Wow. Yeah, yeah, so. It's a common story though. Yeah, but I, you know, even though it's a common story, I don't take it as a, like it doesn't affect me, you know? People like, like to use that as an excuse. Oh, I never had a dad to me. It just is what it is. My mom was my mom and my dad, you know? It's what it is. Yeah. What was your relationship like with your mom? It's good. Yeah, it. Um, I would say coming up, you know, it's rocky just because I I was so much into the streets. But as I got older and she started to kind of just realize, you know, and I mean, he's a man. Then it just kind of just became easier. Like we text each other all the time. Um, last last time I was locked up, shit, she was the only one that came and visit. So you know, so you know, it's like yeah. She gets you. She got me. Yeah, she definitely got me. If I call her, she got me. Yeah. 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 But if she calls me, I got her. So that's yeah. That's, that's great. And what, what, what kind of what kind of trouble were, were the streets getting you into? Um, as a kid, oh shoot. Honestly, always weed. To be honest, that's the craziest thing. From I always caught weed cases, whether it's small weed cases, big weed cases. Um, that's what I was always known for. You know, always known for. And the um, the, 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 the younger crowd is probably forgetting or it doesn't even realize that weed was illegal. Yeah, weed was illegal, right? Very, very, very <laughs> yeah. illegal and, um, at one point. In a lot of these states that it's legal now is the states that I really made a name in, you know, um, from Colorado, be way before it was legal. Um, D.C., Maryland, Florida, Texas. I mean, these were all my stomping grounds, you know. Collinsville, Illinois. Um, yeah. Hmm. We really made a big, big name as far as the that weed movement went, you know, people were, so when you talk about truckloads, we were doing truckloads was, 10 was, years ago. Weed was as serious a, an offense as, as, oh, crack, yeah, yeah, yeah. as crack or anything yep. else, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely. Especially if you're talking about the South, if you want to go into the deep, the, like those Commonwealth areas, the Virginias and stuff, oh man, you're, you're really talking big time, but I, you're I also gotta, talking I, big money. I, you I know gotta mention I mean? that, because now it's just, weed is like, you know, it's like bubble gum. Yeah, it's, it's nothing now, yeah, it's yeah, like yep. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like even um, what? So, I actually caught a case in Illinois a long time ago, and because it became legal, uh, it was what two years ago. They had they had pulled me over. They pulled up the case. It was ten years. They actually put me on house arrest for this case. And what uh, Collinsville, Illinois did? They were just like, oh man, it's legal now. We really can't do anything to him now. Just you know, statute statute yeah, limitations. Just, yeah, just let him go. Yeah, but that was cool. Yeah. Where's Collinsville? Uh, it's right outside of St. Louis. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, Which, I'm a Chicago it, boy, but I don't know Collinsville. Yeah, that's the crazy thing, me either. So <laughs> we're coming from Colorado. I'm coming from Colorado. And um, what happened was, as soon as we got outside of St. Louis, the police just pulled us over. And this is one of the craziest stories. He pulls us over and he says, oh, you guys have, it was me and my boy, he says, you guys have dreads. You guys must be from Illinois, uh, St. Louis. And they're like, yo, with St. Louis guys come over here, they do nothing but cause trouble. And we're like, yo, we know nothing about St. Louis, this, 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 like. And he says, well, we're gonna have to pull the dogs out. Okay, pull the dogs out. They pull the dogs out. The dog doesn't alert. This is probably, this is probably one of my very first drug trafficking cases. The dog doesn't alert. And um, what the cop actually does is he takes the dog, literally takes the dog and throws him into the window. Yeah, yeah. he throws him into the passenger window. And he's like, yeah. He has to smell something. <laughs> I'm like, no way. Yo, and I'm talking about these. We're in the middle of the woods. These cops are chewing. Um, they're chewing. No, not chewing tobacco. They're chewing uh, toothbrushes. Like they're literally chewing toothbrushes. We're in the middle of the woods. Me and my boy are like, oh, my goodness. This is going to be bad. The cops and, are chewing toothbrushes? Yeah, they had toothbrushes in their mouth, chewing toothbrushes. Literally. Yeah. And they were like, what yeah. For? 
And so from there, he just pops the trunk. <laughs> he just goes, Whoo! I'm like, hold up. How do you pop the trunk from throwing the dog in the window? They, they were certain that you were up there. Oh, yeah. And there they go. They find two suitcases full of, you know, a weed. And, oh. yeah, that was one of my early, early, early trafficking days, um, trafficking cases. And, yeah, that was bad. And Collegeville, oh. Illinois is weird. That's one of those jails where they put you in the black and white jumpsuits like life. You know the movie Life? Oh, you're in the black and white jumpsuits, and it's, yeah. Separate the black guys, the white guys. Everybody gets separated. Oh, yeah, it was crazy. How old were you? Um, that happened when I think I was 18. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I was about 18. Yeah. yeah. How, how long were you de- selling or dealing? Oh, I've probably been selling weed all my life. Um, I'd say probably since... I've been smoking weed since fifth grade. Put it like that. I'm 35 years old. Never stopped. Um, but I've probably been selling weed since uh, middle school. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Selling pounds, high school for sure. Yeah, and then once out of high school, we get into the. You go from the, the Greyhounds to the, to the Amtrak's to the to the planes to the trucks. Yeah. <laughs> Your mom stuck by you the whole time. Yeah. Well, no, I wouldn't say that because. Um, the only time she stuck by me, because a lot of times she didn't know what was going on. So, like, I would catch cases. A lot of times I, have, I would have money. So, you know, and I always lived on my own since I was 17. So, um, I'd catch a case. We have money. I'd make sure I get the bill. Like, so a lot of these things she wouldn't even know. The, the time when she really found out is when I caught the case um, going to Maryland. And this is how I got, you know, my no ankle here, you know. And um, So what, what happened to your ankle? You want, you want to tell this story? Yeah. So... Basically, which is crazy, you got to watch out who you are friends with, who you deal with, for sure. Um, so I, was, I had a, a, a nice solid team of females, um, guys, a whole solid team over there in Maryland um, working with me. And um, so I'm in San Francisco. I, usually, I rarely have to come to Maryland so to do what I have to do. You know, the, the pounds get there, the money gets back. That, that's all that matters to me, you know? How would you have and, somebody... Um, Transport it. Those days, for the Maryland days, that's when that would have been the Amtrak's and the Greyhound days. Yep, we were flooding the Amtrak's and Greyhounds. You had you had somebody that would yeah. escort it. Yeah, yeah. You you pay, you get a couple girls from San Francisco. You know, L.A. Like Lauren, surrounding cities. <laughs> Surra- couple from surrounding cities. You pay them a thousand dollars per suitcase. It doesn't matter how many how much is in there. Right. What's in there? Go, you know, and hey, and they'll go with four suitcases, you know, per. Yeah, and it's cool. They put it up under and just ride it on out. That's great. Yeah, and then, um, but yeah, that would that would have been the you know the Amtrak days, and uh, so I'm in San Francisco. We're just I'm just kicking it, and I get a phone call one day that uh one of my partners out there, he's got an ear infection. So I'm like, okay, ear infection, cool. He has to do surgery. It doesn't really bother me, and um. But the very next day, my phone's blowing up, phone's blowing up, phone's blowing up. And, you know, the East Coast, they're, they're three hours ahead. So I'm still asleep. And when I finally answer my phone, they say, hey, Jake actually died from the surgery. And I'm like, whoa. Oh, my goodness. So now it kind of made me have to rush to go. You know, I wanted to hurry up, try to make his funeral. And so this is how God works, too, as well. So first thing I did was I bought an Amtrak ticket to try to get back fast. I bought an Amtrak ticket, and um, because it was so all of a sudden, the girl I was dealing with, I ended up missing the Amtrak that next day. But, which is very crazy, that same Amtrak, if you look at it right now, it actually crashed. That was the Amtrak that crashed in San Francisco. Yeah, it crashed. Yeah, that same exact Amtrak ticket that I bought actually crashed. People died? Yeah, people died and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was one that derailed and people actually died. And so I was like, whoa, okay. But um, so I ended up taking the Greyhound. And so this is like a three, now to end up three, being a three day trip. So I actually missed the funeral, but I'm still going to get down there. Um, I get down there and I, I end up arriving around 5 a.m. It's probably like, not 5 a.m., probably like 3, 4 a.m. And the girls pick me up from the Greyhound. This is way up in like, um, they pick me up from Baltimore. So we're riding from Baltimore to uh, the part of Maryland that, um, where, where the stash houses were at. And this is like a, probably like a 45 minute ride. There's another girl who's also in the passenger seat. 
she's like playing sleep. Like she's like playing, like she's like kind of playing, like she's, you know she's not sleep, but she's playing sleep and it's weird. So I'm already noticing all the weird stuff from the back seat. And as we pull up to the, uh, to the house, there's these guys sitting in the, in the driveway. Um, it's, it's a big apartment building. They're sitting in the, uh, they're sitting in the apartment, but they have their lights on. But as soon as we pull up, they cut the lights off real fast. But I've already seen that there's, it's full of people. So I tell them, hey, stop right here. Stop the car right here, right in front of the building. Let me in right here. So they're like, okay, 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 okay. But as soon as we actually pull up to the neighborhood, the girl that was been sleep, playing sleep, she all of a sudden, she's, she's awake. Like she's, all, she's fully alert and everything. And then um, so I say, let me out here. So I'm kind of I'm kind of hip to what's Gary going. So I go up to the building. It's one of these buildings where the door locks behind you. So I go up. To, I'm going up the steps. I'm going up the steps. As soon as I'm going up the steps, I'm looking down these big glass windows. And I see all the guys running from the truck. Now they're running down, trying to get open to the door. So I'm like, oh, okay. So I know it's going to. Okay. So it's it's two ways they're going to get in. I'm gonna let them in, or these girls are gonna let them in. So. What I do is I take my bag. Mind you, there's nothing in my bag because everything's already here at the stash house. I'm just coming for a funeral. So I have my bag, which is just full of clothes, and I take it and I prop open the door um, of the building, um, not the building, of the actual uh, apartment. And the same thing as the apartment is the same thing as the building. As soon as the apartment closes, it locks behind you. So I prop the door open, and I actually go downstairs and open the door for them. I go and open the door for them and surprise them. They're like, whoa, what the? And they were all, now we're all tussling, we're all tussling. It's like four of them. Um, we're tussling, we're tussling. One of them runs, breaks upstairs, grabs, grabs the bag that's actually propping the door open, and he runs back downstairs. And he's just yelling, I got, I got everything, I got everything. And I'm just thinking in my head, like, okay, he only has clothes, you know? He only has clothes. So before that, dude hits me in the head with a gun. I'm like, oh, shit. Um, so, but we're still tussling. Then they all run out, and they're all still, still, still um, in their car. So what I do is I run up to the building, I run up to the building because they don't have my keys. I still have my keys. So I run up to the, to the apartment. I go up there, grab the bulletproof vest, grab the gun, and now, now it's an okay corral out there. So I run downstairs, and I'm lighting, I light their car up. They're driving off. I'm shooting at their car. And so what happens when I do that is the girls, now the girls are coming back. The girls are coming back. I can surprise. I'm yelling at them because I know they had something to do with it. But um, I guess the whole time when I was doing that and I ran outside, the neighbors called the police and said, there's a guy outside with a bulletproof vest shooting at people. Yo, and he just went into that apartment. So while I'm sitting here yelling at the, I'm yelling at the um, girls, I'm yelling at the girls, I'm calling some of my homeboys that's out there. I'm like, yo, you guys need to get here now. Get here now, get here now. I'm yelling at the girls, yelling at the girls. Um, and uh, next, you know, I'm looking out the windows and I see red and blue and out of every window because these have windows that go all around from back to front, side to side. Everywhere I look, there's red and blue, red and blue, red and blue. I'm like, oh, shit. Uh oh. And then um, I actually still have the vest on. Right. And I'm like, oh, shit, I can't. If they see me with a vest on, they're going to try to shoot me. And that's what I'm already thinking. So I'm trying. I'm getting ready to go to the front door. As I'm going to the front door, I hear them coming up the front door. I'm like, uh oh, now they're coming directly to the door. And then they go, boom, boom. They're, now they're, they're just trying to kick it in. They're just trying to kick it in, kick it in. And then as soon as they do get the door in, boom, they kick it in. Guns are blazing. I'm like, oh, shit. So I actually jump out the window. So when I jumped out the window, mind you, this is Maryland. This is like, uh, I think this was, in, this was February, as a matter of fact. It was February 15th. Um, there was snow in the back. There was no snow in the front. That's the craziest thing. There was no snow in the front. So I go on, and when I jumped in the back, there was full of snow. My foot went right into the snow and cracked. Right over. Yeah, it just, because I jumped, I jumped, what, uh, like five stories. So it just landed, it went into the snow and cracked over. Cracked over. I'm like, oh, shit. And mind you, I have, so before I did all this, too, I threw, the, I threw all the weed out, out the window. So you jumped all out. the money. No, actually, I, I left the weed. I'm tripping. I left the weed in. I threw all the guns out the window. Because I had the house was full of guns, so I put them all in the duffel you, bag. You jumped out of a five-story window. Yeah, but I threw the guns first. I threw all the cash with me, so I had a big duffel bag full of cash and duffel bag full of guns. So now they're on the ground, I'm on the ground, and now I'm just crawling in the snow with two duffel bags. And my uh, my boy's calling now because he's he's now he's getting he's he's getting closer. But I can't answer the phone because it's so wet. It's so wet. I can't answer the phone. I can't answer the phone. I'm like fuck. It won't answer. It won't answer. I'm just like fuck, 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 fuck. It won't answer. And then I'm just I'm just dragging myself, dragging myself, just like just slowly dragging myself, dragging myself. 
I look back and look back and I see them inside the apartment. I can see all the police in the apartment. They can't see me. And the craziest thing, I look over, I also see the neighbor. The neighbor's looking out the window. They're looking out the window. And supposedly, like after I read all the police report, this is also the neighbor that called the police that, with the initial call. Yeah, so they're looking out the window and they even call the police again and say he's actually out in the back. So while I'm crawling, I'm crawling, I'm crawling, I'm crawling. Now I see them coming around the side of the building with all their flashlights. I'm like, oh, shit. So I'm trying to crawl into, under a car. I throw one bag under one car with the guns. I, throw, I, ch- I keep the money bag with me. I was like, fuck this. So I keep the money with me. I'm crawling, I'm crawling, I'm crawling, I'm crawling. And then they don't see me. They go way over here. I'm looking at them. They go way over here. They're not even nowhere near me. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Play. They don't see me. And at the same exact time, my boy is pulling in. So he, now he's pulling in. Now I see his car coming and he's coming in. I said, oh, yes, I'm saved. But they stop him. They stop him. Boom. They stop him. And I said, oh, shit. And he has guns all on his front, you know, on his front seat because he's coming. He's coming ready for war. And um, they stop him. They ask him, yeah, what are you doing? He tells them, oh, well, my, some dudes tried to rob my cousin. And so this is like, oh, so you're part of what we're actually looking for. So they arrest him. Yeah, and I'm watching this whole thing. And then as they arrest him, I see them slowly start walking my direction with the flashlights. I'm like, oh, fuck. And I can't crawl. It's like, I can't go anywhere. My leg is done. Um, it's just done. And so what happens then, they find me. They, they ask me my name. I'm not telling them. I'm like, yo, my leg. Every time they ask me my name, I'm just like, my leg, my leg, my leg. And so they pick me up, and they see my leg just hanging like this, just dangling. They're like, oh, fuck. And so they call the ambulance. They... This is God. This is how God works. So they lock me up, right, to the to the um, to the stretcher. I'm locked up to the stretcher. I have to go to emergency surgery. And so the police are actually arguing with the uh, at the hospital. They're arguing with the people at the hospital. They're like, "You have to keep him uh, handcuffed because of what just happened." But the surgery, the the hospital is telling him we have to take the handcuffs off to do the surgery. There's no way we could do the surgery with the handcuffs. And so literally, these are these are the last words I hear from the cop. He tells this lady. He says, "You know what, lady." When he gets out of this surgery, you better call me because I'm going to lock his ass up, right? So I go to the surgery. You know, I, I go out. I'm on anesthesia. I go out. I actually wake up, and I have all the bars through my leg. I have all the bars through my leg. My, my name actually says John Doe on my um, wristband. Mm. The lady comes back in, and she says this. Here's a wheelchair. Go now. The police are coming. You better go now. Yeah. She let you go. Yeah, she said, you better find a way. But go now. And I was like, oh, shit. What the fuck? What do you mean? Like, because I still don't remember. Like, now I'm kind of, like, confused. I'm like, hold on. What the fuck? Just, like, and um, she's like, just go. So I make a phone call. They come pick me up. And I actually go from Maryland to D.C. now. So I go into the D.C. hospital. I just roll into the D.C. hospital with all the bars and stuff in my leg. I just go in and say, look, I didn't have any insurance. The Maryland, they just kicked me out. They left the bars in my leg and they kicked me out because I didn't have insurance. I need help. Look, it's bleed. Like, it's blood leaking, everything. They're like, what the fuck? What? There's no way they just let. I'm like, yes, trust me. I didn't have insurance. Just, just help me. They're like, oh, fuck no. So they actually, and I end up getting all the surgery from there. So they, <laughs> so they did the surgery as if, you know, I just got kicked out with, you know. And um, so then the, hot, uh, the, the police keep going to the hospital. They're going to the hospital looking for me. They're going to the first hospital. They're, they're trying to figure out what the hell happened, you know. And so after I did the surgeries in D.C., um, I called my boys from San Francisco. I said, you guys got to come get me. I can't be here because this is all bad. So they drive, uh, they drive the truck down. And I literally have a pick line and um, IVs. I have IVs on one side, like just like this. I have a pick line just like this, like from the hospital. And they take me out, and I'm in freaking SUV. And we ride from D.C. to San Francisco with those shits in, in me. And the pick line goes through my heart. Yeah, so we're riding all the way in the truck, escaping another hospital, basically. And, yeah, and it's crazy. When I get to San Francisco, this whole trip, it was fine. As soon as I get to San Francisco, the pick line actually comes out of my heart. Like, it just slides out. And I'm like, oh, shit. And all the blood just starts coming down. I'm like, what the fuck, yo? Yeah. Crazy. Did, did you ever get caught by the cops? Oh, so here we go. So for this case, um, so now I'm back in San Francisco. So I'm back in San Francisco, and uh, I'm doing it. Now I'm like, okay, I got to go to do more surgeries at San Francisco General. So because I had to do so many surgeries, and it's just me leaving so many hospitals was really complicating a lot of shit. There, and I have to make up a new story of why, like, uh, yo, why the hell did this just let you out with the bars? Why are you this, 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 and you didn't do therapy? It's just so I'm in San Francisco. They make me an inpatient. 
because I'm a resident of San Francisco. So they make me an inpatient at the hospital. So I'm at the hospital uh, probably about five, six months now. I'm talking about I'm a real resident at this hospital. I have friends here. I, have, I, have, I know everybody here. One day at the mor- in the morning, um, because also San Francisco General, uh, being that it was a public hospital, they have sheriffs that actually s- stay in the hospital at all times. So one day he literally said he was bored and just ran my name. Yeah, he's like, I was just bored, so I just ran your name because you're, you know, you're just always here because you're here. So he said, I ran your name, and then I saw all the shit. So then uh, they waited till I, um, they waited till they gave me an IV, like a, like they gave me a morphine IV. So I was knocked. I was like, whoa. And then next, you know, I just hear the handcuffs everywhere. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? They're like, yeah. And they pull up a picture from Maryland. They say, look, this is you. You know, uh, three. This is now um, about two years have passed too. They're like, this is you from two years ago. They've been looking for you. This is this, this, this. We're taking you back. Um, well, we're going to see if they want to take you. So they took me to 850 Bryant, which is the San Francisco County Jail. So now I'm sitting in San Francisco County uh, with still halfway through surgeries. And I'm like, yo, what the fuck? Like, what the hell's going on? So, and then, um, so they give them like 60 days to pick me up. You know what Maryland does? Maryland literally waits for the 60th day to come and get me. They come and get me on that 60th day, transfer me on a plane, still fucked up, you know, and taking me to Maryland. I sit in Maryland for nine months fighting the case. And, uh, you know, we just brought the best lawyers and we end up getting a a plea deal of just uh, possession of a firearm uh, while trafficking. That was it? Yeah. Yep. And took the time served. Yep. Pretty good. Yeah. And just had to register like as a gun offender. What year was that? That was 2013. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. Things have changed a lot in the pot game. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, yeah, like I said, that's how, that's why we have no ankle. And I tell people all the time, like, it's crazy because technically I never was ever supposed to walk. That's the thing about being in the Maryland jail, too. So, like I said, I was going through all those jails, still in wheelchairs and all this stuff. When I got to the Maryland jail, because they really hated me, what they did, they took the wheelchair away and they took the cane away. And no, actually, they took the wheelchair away and gave me a cane. And that's what they did. And I'm like, what the fuck? I can't use a cane. I don't I can't walk. You know what I'm saying? And so they were basically forcing me, trying to force me to walk. And so my celly, he's like, shit, bro, we're going to have to learn to walk. And that's literally how I learned to walk was me and my celly every day getting up with the cane, him holding me, me walking every like he literally taught me how to walk back again. Just the craziest thing. Yeah. We were just every day, every day with the cane, every day with the cane. And then I would go do the hospital visits and they were like, hold on, what the hell? Like, there's no ankle there. Like, there's no way you should be walking. You should be in your wheelchair. I'm like, look, we walking. <laughs> we're not doing the wheelchair thing for life. We're going to walk. Yeah. Yeah. What's it, what's it like living that, that lifestyle of a drug smuggler? Honestly, you know, it's always going to be fun when, you, uh, when it's in the moment, you know. The good times is always good. The bad times is always bad. The money's it's good. like this. The money's but good. Yeah, but honestly, too, uh, if you're doing it right, like even when I was, um, let's say, when I had to go to jail. Me doing it right on the streets, I always had money to where I would go to jail and have a, I'd have 10 people commissaries paid for. So I know I was always good no matter what jail I went to. I've been to 11 different counties in 11 different county jails. Um, I did the count the other day. I was like, how many county jails have I been to? I've been to 11 different county jails in different, all different cities. Um, so it's like, and it's awful. We, we traffic it, you know, um, and it's just, yeah, but I always made sure we were good. Yeah, from Collinsville, Illinois, to to Yuma, Arizona, which was probably the craziest stories ever. Um, to what I just told you, you know, it just yeah, we always made sure we were good. Yeah, and, and you, always met some good, solid and, and people. You, you got out of that when it became legalized. Uh for 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 the Maryland case. Well, just just when when pot became less of a so not nah, Maryland Maryland still wasn't legalized really it was just a good lawyer that got me you know out of that um, I think Maryland just became legalized two years ago oh is that right yeah they they're recent yeah they're they're very recent with it um, 
Yeah. Col- Illinois, same way. They're like two, three years with it. Honestly, if my case pulled up four or five years ago, they probably would have arrested me. You know, Collinsville would have took that case on. But it's because it just passed. They were kind of like, bro, you know, it's like – yeah, he's just gonna fight it and probably win. And if he does lock, if we do lock him up, he probably can get out soon. It's just kind of pointless. They're gonna waste more time trying to, you know, just try to fight me and try to do the case. So it's like, nah, just whatever. And what, yeah. what have you done since then? Um, of course I'm a music manager, but uh, of course we caught more drug trafficking cases. <laughs> you know, Yuma, Arizona. Um, probably one of the biggest cases in Yuma, Arizona to this day. I know they say we had one of the longest uh, Border Patrol chases, me and my girlfriend, which is crazy who I'm still with to this day. Third date me of her meeting me, she had to go on a Border Patrol chase. So <laughs> it was a crazy one. Yeah. So tell me about that. Um, so basically, uh, this is when I was actually living in San Diego. So I was living in San Diego, and um, I used to have – Crazy, crazy, crazy amounts going on in Texas. Texas is one of those spots where if you want to make some money, you go to Texas, Florida, those little spots. And so Texas, um, I'm taking, getting ready to take a load down to Texas, and I asked her, I said, you want to go down to Houston? You know, I got a house down in Houston. You got, you know, we just chilling. Go see my friends, this, this, this. I don't tell her the car is loaded, you know. I say go. This is also why she's banned from Enterprise for life. So I tell her to go rent a car. So she go rents the car <laughs> from Enterprise. Um and we hit the road. And Waze, I don't like you for this one because I put Houston, Texas in from San Diego. And what Waze made me do was go through, it was trying to make me go through Mexico. And so as we're driving, we're driving, cars loaded, you know, we're just driving. I've taken this, I've done, I've done the route so many times. I'm just not paying attention. But Waze this time says we're going through Mexico. And as I look up, I see last exit to USA. I look at her and say, last exit to USA. Uh, I keep driving. You know, I keep driving. The next, you know, I see all the Border Patrol lined up. And I'm like, what the fuck? I've never seen this on this, like, on the route before. Maybe it's like just, you know, a random checkpoint. But then it was actually the Yuma, Arizona border checkpoint. As I'm getting closer, getting closer, the dogs are already going crazy. They're barking, they're barking, they're barking, barking. They're trying to, they're already trying to jump at the car, jump at the car. I'm like, oh, shit. And so as I get closer, get closer, they're like secondary. You go to secondary. I look at them, look at her. I said, we gone. <laughs> She's like, oh, well, let's go. Shroom. So we go. Um, as soon as we do that, I look back. They all run into their cars. They run into their cars. They're right behind me. I make the first exit. I hit the first exit. And, and it's pitch black, too. So we hit the first exit. I, we get out the car. I said, come on, let's go. We get out. Now we're on foot. And this is probably the craziest thing. I wish she was here to tell you this. So we're out on foot. And literally, we're in the desert. So we're running, we're running, running. The first three minutes, we're running, we're running. We hit, like, probably over, like, a 10, 20 feet drop. Like, we're ro- I'm talking about where we're rolling, 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 and dirt and everything. You so le- You left the pot in the car? Yeah, we just left it in the car. We're, we're parked in somebody's driveway, literally. So we drive the car. We Like, as soon as we get off the exit, it was full of houses. So I park it in somebody's driveway. <laughs> park right in somebody's driveway. <laughs> get out. And we just, we're gone. So, but the crazy thing, as soon as we run, it was a drop straight down. We both dropped and we're rolling. I'm like, oh shit, we're rolling, we're rolling, we're rolling, we're rolling. And now we're in the real Yuma Desert. We're in the desert now. And um, so we're in the desert and we're just, I tell her, let's go. So I start to see the, I now see the cars starting to hit the exit. They're hitting the exit, um, all the cop cars. So we're just, we're just going forward. All you can do is see, and you can't see nothing. You literally, it's pitch black, it's pitch black. Every couple steps you run, it's barbed wire. So we're running, we're running, we're running, we're hitting barbed wire. We see you have openings of barbed wire, so you can crawl through. I have a backpack on, we have to put it on top to get over. Um, so we hit the barbed wire, we hit the first set of barbed wire. They realize we're not in the car because after a while, we probably got about, I would say, honestly, we probably ran for about 45 minutes to an hour before they even started to come to the woods. It's this this woods was deep. I mean, it was big. So I would say 45 minutes to an hour. We're already in there. We're in there. I'm telling her we got to get to Mexico. You know, like we get to the cross the Mexico border. We cool. We'll be all right. We'll figure it out over there. Get them some cash. You know, I got cash in my pocket. We're just trying to look. We just made it over here. We're from America. We're just trying to party for the night. Boom, boom, boom. You know, we're from Arizona. You know, and 
So we're just running, we're running, running, we're going through, but you literally can't see anything. So you don't know which way to go. You don't know which way to go. Like everything is just pitch black. Everything is pitch black. So we're running for an hour. And literally as, as we start running, then we start to see lights for a highway. I'm like, oh shit, we're getting somewhere. See, the Mexico, we're still, we're still going to be in Arizona. You know what I mean? I don't know if we're going back to where we came from. Like you, you can't, you just don't know. And so we're running, we're running, we're running. We're starting to go closer, closer, closer. And as we start to get close, now you start to hear the dogs. Like the dogs are in, they're in the woods too. So we start to hear the dogs. We start to hear the dogs. We're hearing, AT, we're hearing the ATVs. We're like, oh shit. Like, um, but as we would start to run, the dog, at one point the dogs got real close. We hit barbed wire. That was it. You didn't hear the dogs for a while. So we hit the barbed wire. We're gone. We don't hear the ATVs for a while. Um, I'd say probably another hour and a half. We're still out there. It's cold too. We're out there. We're out there. We're still running. We're still running. And the closer the, the highway looks, it's still getting far. It's like, yo, we're not getting any closer to this shit. We're like, we're, we're running, running, trying to get to the highway, trying to get to the highway. We're not getting there. We're not getting there. Here comes the helicopters. Oh, shit. Here comes the helicopter. It flies past once. When it first flies past the first time, I told her, I said, that's it. I know. Like, I watch plenty of TV. Plenty of TV, and I know real life. I know what that helicopter got on there. So when it did it, it did it the first time. It comes back the second time. But what it does is it, it flies way out. Like, I mean, it'll fly out for an actual, like, 20 minutes out. Then it came back right, right past us again and flew another 20 minutes out. And so I told her, I was like, okay. That second time, they're coming back. So I was like, all right, get on the ground, and I'm going to get on top of you so it looks like we're animals. Because I was like, yo, they got heat. They got the, uh, I know they got the heat sensors on there. They're coming. And so what they do the second time, the third time is they do the same thing. They do the fly out, but then they stop. <laughs> when they stop, they put that spotlight on, and boom, it was right there. And, but it's craziest, the craziest, craziest thing is when they put the spotlight on, as soon as we looked up, the police were already there. They were so quiet. They were that quiet. They literally creeped the whole way, creeped the whole way, creeped the whole way, creeped the whole way. And when the spotlight came on, all we had to do was turn around, and they were, they were literally right there. We were like, what the fuck? Yo, hell, all hell, you know. They just, they're going crazy, dragging us, dragging us, dragging us. They take us to the, one of the craziest, craziest places, the Yuma, Arizona um, Border Patrol Station. Oh, that's one of the worst places ever. I feel, I feel for the uh, migrants that are there. Let me tell you something. They put everybody in silver blankets. They give you like these silver blanket jumpsuits. Everybody's there. We're piled up. I'm talking about I'm in the same cell as kids, adults, granddads. It's all guys in one, but it's from kids on up, you know. Then you got the same thing with the females. The females, kids on up, because it's all migrants in these Border Patrol jets. It's everybody in here, and we're just like literally – they are stuffed. It's shit everywhere. It's stuff everywhere all around. It's shit everywhere. It's pissed. Like, it's, this shit is crazy. I'm like, yo, no fucking way. I'm yelling at them like, yo, I'm not a freaking migrant. You guys got to get me the fuck out of here. And so one of the craziest things, too, is I had, um, I, had, uh, I, had uh, I had THC oil with me, right? And so I had wax, THC oil with me, and they were trying to say that was heroin. Yeah, so they were putting that on the scale saying, yeah, no, 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 you're trafficking Heroin and marijuana. I'm like, no, 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 no. This is not heroin. This is THC. They're like, no, 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 no. This is heroin. I'm like, oh my fucking goodness. So my original charge from them was actually heroin, possession of heroin, and possession of marijuana, you know, with the intent to distribute. And I'm like, oh fuck no. You guys are tripping, you know what I'm saying? And then for my girl, they're trying to give her the same thing. But I just like, no, no, she ain't had nothing to do it, but you know, it's mine. So they were like, okay, they let her go. They're like, okay, well, fuck it. We'll let her go from right here. She's figured her own way. Let her go. We're going to take you, you know, take you to Yuma, Arizona jail. I went to the Yuma, Arizona jail. Um, I sat there for about two weeks. They gave me, I, I went to go see a judge. He gave me a $250,000 bail, 100%. Yeah, no 10%, no nothing. You had to pay whole $250,000 to the court. I was like, God damn it. Okay. So, you know, made the phone calls. They, they got everything together. Um, one cool thing I can't say about the Yuma, Arizona jail is they gave you these little orange phones. Like, it's kind of like a cell phone. So, um, because, like, because uh, I would have to go, I had to go in the medical unit because of my leg. 
So basically, I have a phone in my cell the whole time. A little, like a little orange phone is basically a cell phone. So I can use the phone all day, all day, all day. So I'm making the calls to get the, you know, get the money happening. And um, so when they finally get the money, um, they, you know, they take, they get me out, they bail me out. And um, yeah. And I go to court. The craziest thing too, when I go to court for it, I go to court for it. They say, um, well, the police didn't show up. The police didn't show up. The police didn't show up. They're like, the police didn't show up. They, so they didn't bring anything. So we don't have anything for this case right now. Um, we're going to send you a date to when to come back. And they never ever sent me a date. Yeah. <laughs> That's the end of it. Yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been through locked up. I've been this, this, since then. It's never popped up. No nothing. It's never been a warrant. No nothing. It's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> oh, because oh, oh, the cops don't show. Yeah, yeah, right? I'm like, whoa, what the hell? Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, from there, it's just, we kind of transition to what I do now. <laughs> Which is? Um, I would say probably one of the most prominent and, you know, I call myself the, the millionaire middleman, you know. From the middleman, from the music industry to the to the streets. The, as far as the music industry goes, you know, I'm the the man that's behind a lot of people's careers. You know, from Boozy Badass to Julio Fulio to Freddie Gibbs to Raven Justice, Big Baby Glenn Davis. Um, a lot of people, you know. How, how did you make that transition? The craziest thing was Boozy. Boozy actually was the one that made me the transition. Boozy being me and Boozy being so close, um, he kind of helped me with the transition from just going to the streets. Cause at the end of the first, um, of course, everything we did was all street, you know, whether it's me bringing weed to Atlanta, me bringing weed to here, we were in, it's just, just what it is, what it is. But um, it kind of transitioned from there to where he's like, bro, I could just put you on with, you know, when they, when they call me to book a show, I'm gonna just tell them to call you. So it's the contacts you made selling weed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. me being me, in the weed industry, like if I'm if I'm in North Carolina, if I'm in Atlanta, from any any city I touch, I'm a, I'm just gonna be like I'm in San Francisco or I'm in DC. Like I'm gonna make you know I'm gonna go to the best club. We're gonna spend the most money, and we're gonna be in the best sections. We're gonna make sure you know who, you know who's who, you know. And and I'm not from around here. You can tell I'm not from around here. So it, come on and see what's going on, you know and. Relationships start like that, and I feel like weed is universal. Weed brings everybody together, and that's really how it happened, you know. And um, and from there, we just, from just being being what what he would consider his weed man to his manager, you know. And from there, making a lot of connections. Um, and and me being in in California, you know, it's different. Uh. uh this is the this is the mecca for the entertainment, you know, the entertainment industry. So, when I make my connections there, I also make my own connections here, and then I bring in, I bridge those gaps together. And um, I've been doing that for so long, from whether it's San Francisco, whether it's L.A., whether it's Atlanta, whether it's D.C., Miami. I just bridge these little gaps. I network. I know how to network. I know how to talk. You know, um, and I put a lot of deals together. You know, and then I think that just people see the the a lot of the success that. I helped, you know, I had with Boozy, um, whether it's the brand deals, whether it's actual bookings, you know, and it just kind of, the clients kind of just trickled in from there, you know, yeah, and then. Not, the not story. many stories, not many people make it out of the streets. Yeah, and, to, to the, yeah, that's the thing too. It's like, success story. yeah, that, that's, that's another thing too. I feel like that's also why um, a lot of people trust me with their careers too, you know, because of, of the stuff I've been through, you know, they know, you know, I was, I'm the one that's always in charge too, and and I, I think that's also how I get a I acquire these good relationships with a lot of big artists. It's because in my world, I'm I'm up there too. You know what I'm saying? In your world, you're there. In my world, I'm here. So when we connect, it's you know, it's just I don't look at you. You you, you know what I mean? You're no bigger than me. You know I, that's how I always see it. And so even. And that's why I always me and my cli- we're always good friends. You know, I don't even look at say people are my clients and stuff. Do we always friends, you know what I mean? Just yeah. All, all my manager, we're always friends. We're just good friends. You that's know? great. And I make it happen. That's yeah. the way to do it. Some of the best, best deals. Right now, like with Freddie Gibbs, me and Freddie Gibbs, we've been going crazy. We've been going crazy from weed deals to comedy shows to actual action figure toys to 
deals with PacSun to, uh, I mean, yeah, I don't stop. Yeah. And you've been doing this for how long? Um, the music industry, I was, I'm going on probably about almost eight years now in the music industry. More yeah. fun than the weed? Uh, yeah, it's more fun than the weed, but you know, the weed's still in the music industry. The good yeah. thing about that too is a lot of my friends that, uh, coming up being, a, being what I was in the weed industry became legal. So a lot of these people, I know most of these weed owners, you know, because of what I do, what I've been doing. So, you know, I know Burner. I know, uh, I know Pat from Cure Company. You know, I know these different people because of what I've already done in the street. So they're like, oh, you know what I mean? They just happen to go to the legal side, which I should have did, you know. And, you know, they just turned it up a whole other level. Is, is it just as lucrative now that it's legalized as it was when it was illegal? Uh, more. Because, you know, these guys make, Millions and millions out of these stores, you know. Yeah, you can make millions in the weed game, but the hardest thing is is you make a million dollars in in, in in Florida, the hardest thing is getting it back to California. You know, I've always had problems with that. I remember one time I was uh, bringing 350000 from D.C. to San Francisco on the Greyhound, and um, we ended up stopping in Colorado. That's where the stop was. And because you stop in Colorado and weed is there, the next stop was... It was either Salt Lake or Mont Montana. It was one of those one of those two cities was the next stop. And what they did was they searched the bus because of that. Pulled everybody off to search the bus. And I'm like, oh fuck. This is about to be bad. And so what they also did, they made they put a stamp. The police they 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 searched everybody's bags under the thing. And what you had to do was line up and get your uh your pass stamp to say that you got searched. And so when it came to me, so I had the money, it's, it's on me, right? So I have, it in a, um, I have it in a little duffel bag. I'm like, fuck. And so they're searching your person's bags and your, under, un, your undercarriage bags. So there's literally these two old ladies sitting at the Greyhound station. And so I just walk next to them. I sit there and I put my bag right in between them. 350000 just sitting right with cash, just sits there. And then they call me and they go up, yeah, you have any bags? I'm like, no, nah, I don't have any bags. I'm just, well, I'm traveling. There. Okay, stamp my thing. And I just wait, wait, wait till they call the bus. And I don't touch my bag. I leave my bag. I'm just having my eye on it. I'm like, yo, these ladies better not touch this shit. And so I'm just looking. They don't never touch the bag. And then they call, they call the Greyhound. It's time to go. I'm like, oh shit. And I just wait, run over, walk slowly, walk over there, grab my bag, and I get on the bus. They look at my pass to see I got searched. So they think my bag is searched and let me on the bus. I'm like, oh my fucking goodness. Yeah. There's a lot of stress in that life. Oh yeah. That's the thing too. Yeah. You know, I would love to just. Because I also owned a dispensary. That's the thing, too. So I owned a dispensary in San Diego. When I lived in San Diego, I actually owned a dispensary. Yeah. Um, one of the first black people to own a dispensary in San Diego. That was one of my very well titles I love to just spread to the world, you know. One of the first black owners of a dispensary in San Diego. But what happened was they didn't want to renew my license after they ran my background. Yeah, they were like, hold up. I don't even know how you did the license in the first place. But, yeah, we can't renew this one. Yeah, but it was a good run while, you know, that's, and that dispensary actually is what paid my bail when I caught, because I owned the dispensary when I caught the Arizona case. Yeah, so that was how I paid my bail, the 250000 was a dispensary. So that also kind of answers the question there. The dispensary game is like, you know, I was able to just go to the dispensary like, yo, I need the two fifty out of the dispensary. And, well, are there other things you learned in that game that helps you now with the music industry? Um, yeah. Um, like, so, so for right now, I like to consider myself a shark. You know, you can only be two things. You could be a shark or a shrimp, right? And so I think me being a shark in the weed game helped me be a shark in the music industry. That's how I able to acquire all these brand deals with all these different companies. You know, um, if I go in for a deal, it's not going to be for, for just one little check. No, we're going in for a lifetime deal or we ain't signing the deal. You know, you tell me, all right, my bookings are 15,000. Okay. I'm going to go tell them, we're getting 20, 20,000. We're going to try to work it from there. I'm going to get you more than what you asked for. You know, it just got to be a shark. And that, I think, that mentality translates from oh, yeah. something like smuggling weed to, to yep, yeah. another industry. Yeah, got to be, you got to be, you know, and be on, being on point, you know. Being on point is one of the biggest things, you know. I think being on point helped me stay alive a lot of times. You know, I've been in when you say being shootouts on point, and all types of stuff. Like When you say being on point, you mean what? Um, just knowing your surroundings. You know, you always got to know your surroundings and try to be knowing one step ahead of people. Knowing what's up. Yeah, yeah. I've been in a, I've been in shootouts where, I've actually been in a shootout here in L.A., you know what I mean? On Broadway, where, you know, stuff happens where luckily I'm here, you know what I'm saying? But um, 
yeah, people, um, I was leaving out of the studio one time, and um, this is the craziest shit. So I'm leaving out of the studio, and we go to the spot, I'm getting ready to drop off some weed, and I'm chilling in front of my boy's house, and car passes. Okay, car passes. But it's the same car that was just at the studio, because let's, let's rewind it. So I'm at, at the studio, when I pull up to the studio, there's actually like this dark like Volvo sitting at the studio. A couple guys in there, but it was tinted out, but they were still sitting in the car. So when I go into the studio, I go into the studio, I'm showing some guys some weed. I got jewelry on and stuff. Um, I come out the studio and then I leave. So I leave out the studio. Now I'm at my boy's house. This is like, now I'd say 10, 20 minutes away from the studio. I leave. We're out there for about an hour, standing out front. Next thing you know, that same car from the studio passes. But I didn't really think about it as the same car, so it passes. And then it passes, and then um, it parks behind the building. So I don't really, I don't know this because, you know, the neighbors started telling us this. So it parks behind the building. As I'm walking to my car, so I'm walking to my car. As soon as I open my door, two guys, they're literally behind my car. They just pop up. Yo, give me all the jewelry. I'm like, oh, oh shit, okay. I know what time this is. But I have the pistol on me. So I'm like, okay. So as I'm trying to, as I'm doing this, so what I do is I take off, I'm trying, acting like I'm taking off the chain with one hand. I'm like, hold on, hold on, hold on. So I'm doing this and I just whip out. Whew, and now it's a shootout. Yeah, and one of them made it home, one of them didn't, you know. But at the end of the day, a little self-defense, but um, yeah. The, the hood is rough. Yeah, the hood is rough. And but the crazy thing about that is, so as I'm going home, so we leave, I, I leave out. And this is the crazy thing how they actually even knew where I was. So I go home and um, I hit a speed bump. I hit a speed bump because this is, I'm driving my coupe. So I'm driving my coupe, is low. So I hit a speed bump and I hear a ding. I'm like, what the fuck is that? And so it's loud too. So then I hit another speed bump. Now I hear it again, ding. And I'm like, what the fuck? So then I park the car, I look under my car and there's a tracker under my car. I can show you, yeah, I'll show you. It's, I still have the picture. Yeah, it's a GPS tracker under my car. I'm like, oh shit. Yeah, so they must have put it under there under the studio. Yeah, and tried to follow me. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Yep. An Amazon tracker at that, because I looked at it. You buy this shit on Amazon for like $15. But obviously that shit worked, because they knew exactly where I was. Man. Yeah. And then the studio mm-hmm. guy, huh? <laughs> How long you been in LA? So I moved from San Diego to LA. You know what's crazy? So my name, my first name is actually Bryant, B R Y N T. The day I was moving my bags from San Diego to LA, my phone was going crazy because that's the same day Kobe Bryant died in the helicopter. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So like four or five years ago. Yeah. So when LA lost one Bryant, they acquired another one, you know? And did yeah. you live in the hood then? When I moved to LA, mm-hmm. I moved to a career town. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Career town was cool, you know. I, I never, see one thing about me, um, I've always been infatuated with the streets at the end of the day. The thing about the difference between like LA and the Bay is that LA is gangbanging. You know, the Bay is always, it's still street life, but the, the, the Bay is more hustling and pimping, you know, but it's still the streets. It still gets, it still gets grimy. It still gets rough. You know what I mean? So it's just a matter of where streets you are. And, and the same thing, even when I'm in Florida, I'm in Jacksonville, I'm on Arlington road in Jacksonville, Florida. You know what I mean? That's, it, go, it goes down. So it's like, even when I'm in different cities, I'm always in the hood. I feel like it's not that that's where I feel most comfortable. It's just, you know, that's where the money's at. <laughs> you know? That's where the money is for you. That's where the money's at. You know, that's where the, you know, that's where they show in love. You know, I don't really have problems in the, I never really had problems in the hood. Um, Cause you know, it's all about the energy too you bring. You know, I always go off good vibes, good vibes. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it's like this. I'm supplying the hood. You can't rob the supplier. You rob the supplier, then I'm not coming back. Fuck that. You know what I'm saying? So, shit, what's the point? And that's also why I have other people in these places to make sure when I land and I touch down that everything's okay. You know? The, the, you know, the red carpet is laid out just as if you would have came to California. I would make sure the red carpet is laid out. So, yeah. All right. BMAC. Interesting stories. Yes, sir. I'm glad you're doing well now. Yes. Uh, appreciate that. Yes. Thank you, man. Appreciate it.